I recently heard uh, an influential Orthodox Jewish guy who was being interviewed about Jesus, at least in part, and the interviewer asked him what he thought of Jesus, and he said, well, you know, I don't believe he was divine, and uh, I don't even believe that he was a prophet. And the guy said, well, then who do you believe he was? He said, well, he was just a guy who tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for it. That was his answer. But I just want to suggest to you that a careful reading of the Gospels shows that that is not at all who Jesus was. Jesus was clear that he was not, in fact, leading a revolt. He was not trying to establish a kingdom in opposition to Rome, not, at least not a physical one. One of the best passages that illustrates this fact is, is the feeding of the 5,000. When people wanted to force him to be king, his response was to send away his most ardent the supporters, his disciples first, and then dismiss the crowd and get alone with God. Clearly not the actions of a man who wants to drum up political support for a, an earthly messianic kingdom against Rome. So the first thing Jesus does here, you'll notice I said, is that he dismisses, dismisses the crowd uh, and, or sends away his disciples and dismisses the crowd. But the second thing he does here is very important to see as well, and that is he gets alone with God to pray. Matthew emphasizes twice here in the text that this is a private time of prayer. You'll notice in verse 23 there, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. He's alone. You know, sometimes it's important to pray together with other believers. I mean, Sunday morning is a great example of that. This is a priority. We should be gathered every Sunday as God's people to pray together, to worship together, to receive instruction from God's Word together. I'm sort of preaching to the choir because you're here. But, but it's a good reminder that we, we do things corporately because God commands us to do things corporately. And, um, but, but what we have to understand is public prayer never replaces private prayer with God. Jesus repeatedly illustrates this in the Gospels. Ministry does not trump personal worship, not even for Jesus. And if it doesn't trump a private time with God for Jesus, you can be sure it doesn't trump one for you either. I imagine Jesus was worn out and he desired just to be refreshed with his quiet time with the Father. This all Think of all this just, uh, if you could for a moment, think of all this just happened in such a short amount of time. Uh, Jesus has spent the day, we, we learned from the text last week, He spent the day healing the sick in the crowd. And then when evening came, He performed the miracle here of the feeding of the 5,000. Then He had to deal with the pressure from the crowd who were trying to coerce Him to become a king. All of this on top of grieving the horrific unjust murder of John the Baptist. And so Jesus, He's physically and He's emotionally spent. He, and so He gets alone with God where he finds solace and renewal. And this made me think about my life and yours. What do you find solace in? What do we do when we are emotionally drained, when we are physically spent? Now you say, well, I take a nap. Or maybe you, you zone out watching Netflix. You don't even know what you're watching and in fact, uh, you, you fall asleep watching it, or, or, or maybe you surf the, the, the web, or, or you just mindlessly scroll through social media. We, we all do those kinds of things, something like that. But do you ever pray? Do you ever just get alone with God and say, Lord, renew my, my strength, my joy? Lord, renew my resolve? Fill me afresh with power on high, from on high? We should learn from Jesus. This is exactly what we need. Are you with me this morning, church? Yes. All right. Just want to make sure you're awake. Some of you are snoozing. I just want to wake you up. Wake up. Number two, we're looking at the rescue of the disciples down in verses 24 through 27. It, so it's evening when the disciples set out across the lake. But now it, it, it's, it, it was evening. Now it's late into the night. And Matthew says they are a long way from the shore. In fact, Mark's account tells us they're in the middle of the lake. John mentions this detail. They've been rowing for three to four hours, or three, three to four miles, rather. So the picture here is that the disciples, they're tired. 
They're afraid. They're far from the safety of the shore. And as the text says, they're beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. They're rowing against a headwind, which is incredibly difficult. Uh, As you row, there's the increased resistance. Each stroke feels heavier, more labored because you're you're pushing against the force of the wind. Boat stability is is challenging. Uh, Navigation is complex, requiring frequent course corrections. Visibility is difficult because of the wind, the rain, the waves, the spray that you're getting. And by the way, don't forget that all of this takes place in the dark of night. So this is not easy. You know, one of the things that if you're, you're a boater that you always look for if you're out on the water is your markers, your channel markers. Uh, and, and it's very, very easy to, to get off course and to lose your footing and like, where in the world are we? I, you know, you wouldn't think that would happen, but you can get out on a body of water like the James River or the York River, and you can get totally lost. You're like, where in the world am I right now? In de- broad daylight, <laughs> with everything being perfect. So imagine you, you maximize that. There are no lights. There are no signs. It's the dark of night. It's a raging storm. And speaking of raging storms, the Sea of Galilee, we've talked about this before, it can become suddenly rough due to a combination of wind and and geographical factors. So the lake is, as we said last week, is relatively small. It's 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by these hills. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. And these strong winds, they rush down these hills onto the lake. And what that does is it creates these crazy storms that just whip up in a second. They're called, they, they kind of call them the, the uh, Sea of Galilee storms because everybody knows that's going to happen if you get out there on it. It can, it can change in just a moment. And so this is what they're going through. And by the way, this has happened once before. You might remember back in Matthew chapter 8. They're scared as well then. But in that situation, Jesus is on the boat with them. He wakes up. He calms the storm. This time, they're all alone. Jesus is nowhere to be found. This is a much bigger test of their faith. Now, I use the, the term there, testing of their faith, for a reason, because This is not an accident. Remember, Jesus is the one who sent them into the boat. He sent them to go ahead of Him. He he sent them out into the lake. He knew a storm was coming, and Jesus sent them straight into it. Now, the question we have to ask is, why would He do this? Why would Jesus send His disciples deliberately onto a lake when a storm was coming? Well, Mark's account tells us this. It's a detail. It says that the disciples had not grasped the full significance of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. You say, how can that be? And the Scripture just says their hearts were hardened. And so the storm at sea and the miracle of walking on the water were opportunities for the disciples to grow in their faith and their understanding of Jesus. But let me pause and just ask you, brothers and sisters, do you not see a coarse significance of this story? See, some Christians wrongly conclude that trials and hardships are always a result of sin and disobedience in your life. Somebody looks at you, you're going through a hard time, and they're like, well, what in the world did you do? What sin have you... You must have done something wrong to be going through what you're going through. I remember when I was 18, I shared this story once before, but I was 18, I had, uh, I've, I've had lung surgery. And uh, a dear lady, a godly lady... Uh, who's still alive, came to visit me in the hospital. And, uh, and she said to me, in no uncertain terms, maybe this lung surgery happened to you because there's sin in your life. Have you thought of that? And I, you know, was like, yes, ma'am, I have thought about that. Um, but I don't think that's the case in this situation. Right? Sometimes suffering is in the will of God for your life. I mean, consider this. Remember the story of Jonah? Do you remember that story? Jonah disobeys the Lord, and because of that, because he disobeys the Lord, he heads right into a storm, right? The storm is a result of his disobedience. But you'll notice here the 12 disciples got into a storm precisely for the opposite reason, because they obeyed the Lord. He's the one that sent them. In fact, you could say it this way, the disciples could not have been more perfectly in the will of God. And what happened? Well, the sea was raging, the boat and the crew were overwhelmed. Their fear, their stress was off the charts, their anxiety was through the roof, and they were exactly where Jesus 
wanted them to be. This whole event increased the faith of the disciples. And you know what? God-appointed trials sometimes do that in us. One of the recurring things I have heard from many Christians in this church and in other church I, churches I pastored is people who have told me about the, the worst trials of their life. And, and they share with me how, how painful, how sorrowful, how difficult those trials have been. And then they say, you know what? That was the, I, in fact, I had this happen again just the other day. Somebody said to me, I think I've grown the most during this time. While it might not be true with every trial, it is often true that through such storms, God cultivates a righteousness, a deeper relationship w within us that would not exist had we not gone through what we've gone through. And though they felt alone, Mark's gospel tells us that they weren't. Jesus saw his disciples in their hour of greatest need. In John uh, or Mark's gospel, it says, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Brother, sister, if you're going through a storm this morning, please don't think you, your, your, your sorrow, your suffering, your tears, please don't think they have escaped the attention of Jesus. Please don't think for one moment He does not see you right now feeling the way that you feel. Jesus never intended to leave them alone in the storm. In fact, remember, Matthew tells us He sent them ahead of Him. Instead, He came to them in their hour of most desperate need. Verse 25, look at it. It says, And in the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea. Um, in the, the night in that culture was from sunset to sunrise, and, and the Romans divided night into what they called watches. And they had four watches, four watches of the night. You could be in the first, second, third, fourth. This is the fourth watch, you'll notice, of the night, which was 3 to 6 a.m. That's, that's the period of time we're talking about. And, and that little detail is important because it powerfully illustrates, um, the, highlights the weariness of the disciples, their desperation. They began their journey in the evening, and now in the darkest hours of the night, their strength is nearly spent from hours of relentless rowing. So here they are, they're exhausted, they're filled with anguish. They are at their breaking point. You ever been at a breaking point? And it is at precisely this moment of greatest need that Christ came to His people. But this Jesus walking on, on the water, on the sea, doesn't initially cause the reaction that you would think. They're kind of freaked out by it. I think I would be too. They conclude here, it's a ghost. I mean, think about that for a moment. What else would you think if you were out in the dark of night and there's a sea raging and you see somebody walking across the water? What would your thought be? I'm pretty sure I'd think it's something dark, sinister, something scary, evil, maybe you know, some diabolical ghost. Who knows? We, we would think that. And, and there are also pagan ideas in the culture that probably influenced the, 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 um, the disciples at that time, even though they didn't fully buy into it. You know, there was this idea that evil spirits dwelt in the deep of the sea and that if you, you, you drowned at sea um, without having, as strange as this sounds, a coin in your mouth, that uh, you couldn't cr cross over the river Styx, which is the Greek mythological river that leads to, I think, Hades. There was all these weird ideas, and perhaps the, the disciples are worried. Maybe they're thinking, oh man, we're about to die without any kind of recourse here. But verse 27 says this, Immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. What makes you afraid? Is it being alone? Is it being in the dark? Maybe it's something as simple as just going out in public. It could be something as generic as I'm afraid of spiders, or I'm afraid of snakes. Could be public speaking. Apparently, that's a pretty big one. In fact, I had somebody just this week tell me that um, they jumped out of an airplane on purpose. Right? They, 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 they did the whole parachuting thing, jumping out of an airplane. They've done that now once or twice on purpose. And they said they would rather do that again than speak in public. 
I will take speaking in public. Just remember this, whatever scary storm you're in, whatever thing that it, there is that terrifies you, Jesus says to you, don't be afraid, I'm with you, you can trust me in the storm. Well, we've looked at the sending of the disciples, the rescue of the disciples. Let's look at number three, the opportunity for the disciples. I'm down in verse 28 here, and this part of the story is only found in Matthew's gospel. Look with me at Peter's request here in verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. You know, in the Gospels, Peter is often the disciple who exemplifies impetuousness and a willingness to, to take the lead in a situation. He, he's, got some, he's got some bravado. He's, he's the alpha male. He often quickly speaks up, but sometimes he, you know, he lacks wisdom. Sometimes he puts his foot in his mouth. And once again, Peter here is willing to speak up, and he, he makes this bold request to Jesus to come out to him on the water. Peter is a, is a man with a lot of potential, and Jesus sees that. And so he, he invites him to come. Now, Matthew describes the situation this way. Jesus walks on the waves of the sea, but Peter walked on water. Do you see the difference? Jesus walked at length the lake, the lake but Peter took a few steps. His faith did not last. And yet, I think despite this fact, Peter is to be commended. I mean, no one else in the boat was willing to take such a step of faith. I mean, surely Jesus would have extended that, that same opportunity to others, but none were willing to make that request. Peter here has faith that Jesus is Lord of the winds and the wave. You'll notice he says, command me to come out to you. If you can command the waves and the wind, if you can walk on, on, on nature, and, and, and if you can um, suspend the, the laws of nature and walk on water, then you certainly can command me to do the same. That's what he's saying. And so to get out of the boat and to even attempt to walk on the water, that's a pretty good act of faith, even if his faith here falters. But what can we learn from Peter's sinking here in the story? Well, we can, learn, we can learn this. What's the most important thing here to see about Peter? Well, I think what's most important to see is when his faith was strong, his eyes were on Jesus and his ears were listening to him. The moment he took his eyes off of Christ is the moment that he began to sink. The moment he looked at his circumstances is the moment he began to fail. Notice what verse 30 says, but when he saw the wind, you don't see the wind, right? You understand what it means. It means he saw the effects of the wind. He was afraid and he began to sink. Doubt and fear always go together. Peter started focusing on the fury of the of the storm, the precarious circumstances he was in, rather than keeping his eyes on the power of Christ to sustain him. And that's when his faith waned. Now, how do we keep our eyes on Jesus in the midst of a storm? I mean, we obviously can't see Jesus like Peter did. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus when we're going through a storm? Here's the answer. You keep your eyes on the promises of his word. You meditate on what he has said to you from the scriptures we rebuke our doubts with the promises of His faithfulness. And one more thing before we, we move on here. Jesus' power and love were not dependent upon the strength of Peter's faith, but on Christ's love here and His commitment to His people. You'll notice when Peter cried out, Lord, save me, Jesus' response was fast, and it was secure. In verse 31, we read, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter's faith was not perfect. It needed to grow. And you know what? The same is true about your faith and mine. It's easy to shout, Praise the Lord. It's easy to be like, you know, shine, Jesus, shine, when everything is going, going great in your life, when the days are sunny. But what about when the, the night is long? What about when the future in a particular area of life is uncertain? What about when you feel like you're stuck in your own version of Groundhog Day, uh, just a, a, and, and it's a perpetual 
loop of, of just misery and depression. Do we have faith to trust Christ then? Is our faith in Jesus something that's just merely initial? Is it just for salvation? Or is your faith in Christ for all of life? Are you willing to take a step of faith in your life? Are, are you, let me ask it this way. Are you willing to get out of the boat that you're in and attempt something great for Christ? Friends, let's never forget that it's better to take a step of faith, even if you struggle along the way, than to remain in the boat and take no risks in life. As one writer quipped, it's better to be a wet Peter than a dry Thomas. That's a good word. So is there an area right now in your life that requires real faith? I mean, taking, it could be taking a relationship to the next level. It might be switching careers. It might be moving to a new place. It could be that you're going to step out and try something new in ministry for God. You might stumble. You might even fail. But never forget that through it all, Christ will be with you. And faith honors Him. It's better to get out of the boat and attempt something for God than to stay safely in it. Number four and finally, let's look at the worship by the disciples. One of the silliest ideas that people have ever put forward is that Jesus didn't declare to be divine. And as we've been working our way chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew, we are seeing example after example of how Jesus does declare His divinity. Now, Jesus, it's true, He didn't go around shouting, I am God! And for good reason. If you go around shouting, I am God, that's the kind of thing you get locked up for. People think you're crazy. Instead, Jesus subtly declared His divinity in the Gospels a number of ways. He did it through His words. He said, I am the Father of one. Before Abraham was, I am. He said, if you have seen the Father, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So He did it through His words. He did it through His actions, forgiving sins, performing miracles. He did it through exercising His authority over the, the, uh, the laws of nature and creation. And then finally, He did it in receiving the worship of others. Notice verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped Him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, you might think that the reaction of those in the boat is simply because Jesus walked on the sea, but there, again, as often is the case, there's more to see here in the story. Jesus' actions here of walking on the sea show His unity with the Father. And those, I think, in the boat... At least some of them, they understood it. I don't know if they understood it that day or later, but they got it. Jesus did only what God could do. You see, in the Old Testament, it is God who demonstrates His sovereignty over creation, and in particular, over the waters. Job chapter 9, verse 8. God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. It's exactly what Jesus does. Psalm 77, verse 19, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Isaiah 43, verse 16, this is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. And so by walking on the sea, what is Jesus doing? He's fulfilling an Old Testament motif. He is the Lord, treading the waves of the sea, clear, clearing the path through the waters to show his people the way through. He is Yahweh in the flesh. Now, because of this, critics have desperately tried to discredit this miracle. Some have suggested that Jesus walked on hidden rocks, you know, underneath the water. He knew where the rocks were. Others have suggested that it was somehow shallow and that uh, he, he gave, it just gave the appearance that he walked on the water, but that doesn't really fit the the bithymetry of the Sea of Galilee, there's no such shallow sections, at least not in the middle, only on the edges. The water's pretty deep. It's over 100 feet in some parts. And, and by the way, the gospel writers are clear here. You'll notice that the disciples, it says they were far from land. They'd been rowing for miles. They're roughly in the middle of the lake when Jesus comes to them. Now, if Jesus had faked this miracle by walking on rocks under the water, how in the world do you find that sort of thing in the middle of a storm? And don't you think that Peter and the other fishermen who had spent their lives fishing on this, this, this lake, 
that they would call Jesus out for faking such a miracle? I mean, if there's one thing that fishermen know, they know the waters that they fish on for a living. If you want to know how to navigate James River or York River, get a fisherman because they can tell you, don't go there, you'll run aground. Don't do that. That's, that's not a safe area to, to boat through. Right? If, if Jesus had faked this miracle, rather than offering worship to him, they would have given him ridicule for his actions. No, Jesus faithfully rescues his people. But what is next here for his, his followers who just came through this storm? Well, the answer is more ministry. Let me quickly read to you these verses and then we'll be done. <clears throat> and when, verse 34, and when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. When they reached the other side of the storm, the other side of the lake, they found a place that was filled with great need, with hurting people in need of a Savior. And you'll notice here, often Jesus requires faith, but th what we see here is a picture of real grace. They just reach out and touch His garment, and they're healed. And I think the message here for us in these final two verses is simply this, that storms do not sideline us from ministry. Rather, they refine us for more ministry, for more service to others. They prepare us for what's ahead, and, and man, do the disciples need preparation for what is coming, as we'll see in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has many more great opportunities for them, and He does for you and me as well. 